This is a rather unusual video for this channel, or at least I hope it will be, as my primary intention has always been to just share stories here. Then again, perhaps this video will be something of a story, just not in the traditional sense. The story of how the legacy of the USS Indianapolis became inundated with myths. I wanted to share this video to elaborate on several of these myths that were presented as known facts in the part one episode and were then corrected in part two. I also said that this would be a short video, but after compiling the script, rather than cutting it down to size, I figured that if it was worth doing at all, I should include the relevant details. The fact is, I am not the only person who has shared this story. There are many books, films, and other productions about it. And most, if not all of them, have unfortunately presented these myths as fact. So you might consider this third video as both an extension of the story, as well as an addendum, meant to correct some unfortunate inaccuracies. The following is a list of these myths, at least those that are known at the time of this video's creation. So, how do we know these are now debunked myths? The debunking of these was made known through very recent announcements by the chairman of the USS Indianapolis Legacy Organization, retired Navy Captain William Toady, a man you will recognize if you are familiar with the story. The story of the Indy is incredibly compelling. With all that true history, you would think that no embellishment of their story would be necessary. And yet, a mythology has emerged around the ship, some crafted by authors who didn't have the correct information when they wrote their books, some crafted by people who simply accepted statements that later proved to be untrue, some created by those who simply wanted to exploit the horror the survivors experienced in order to make money. Regardless, in too many cases, the fiction has come to overwhelm the truth. Sadly, even the survivors themselves have been led to believe many of these myths about how their ship was sunk, about who was responsible, and a number of other heartbreaking additions about the life and tragic death of their captain, Captain McVeigh, whom they all loved and had the greatest respect for. This is, of course, frustrating, because of all the stories I have worked on so far, especially the stranger ones, which often rely heavily on a single person's eyewitness testimony, this is certainly one of the most well-known and highly documented stories in military history. It would take hours to cover the depth of all of them, but the following two myths are among the most egregious ones that I want to discuss, since they were both presented as facts in my first episode. Myth number one. Captain McVeigh requested, but was denied, an escort from Guam to Leyte Harbor when the ship was attacked. Here is the clip from that episode where this is stated as fact. Now finding themselves back in enemy waters, the ship's crew thought it odd their ship was being sent alone. As the Navy manual strictly stated that a ship that size required a destroyer escort in enemy waters. The captain's multiple requests for an escort were denied, however. They were assured there would be no enemy subs where they were going. This myth is a pivotal part of the story because had the ship been provided an escort, it likely would have never been sunk. And this myth is so ingrained into the story that even the survivors themselves were clearly led to believe this is what happened. After we delivered the bombs at Tinian, we went back by Guam and got some supplies. Orders were given to the Captain McVeigh to proceed to Leyte in the Philippines. I've said it many times, even the Navy manual states that the ship our size in enemy waters must have a destroyer escort. But we were denied it. And they told him, no, sis, you don't need one. There are no enemy submarines in the area where you're going. So we proceeded without one. Of course, on the 30th of July, just after midnight, we were hit by two tor torpedoes from a submarine and sunk. Now, it has already been established that Captain McVeigh was in no way at fault for the sinking of his ship, and this myth would seem to advocate for his innocence while simultaneously shifting blame onto those men who denied his requests for an escort. But aside from casting unfair blame on unnamed Navy officials, I have also seen chilling theories presented that the Indianapolis might have been deliberately left vulnerable without an escort, 
because of their previous top secret mission in transporting an atomic bomb from San Francisco to Tinian Island. As if to say there was some insidious conspiracy to have the ship sunk and its crew forever silenced because of their direct or indirect involvement with the atomic weapon. Even if Captain McVeigh had been denied an escort, that theory seems to be the stuff of movie fiction. It seems to suggest that treasonous American naval officers were in cahoots with the Japanese and secretly working with them to sink the ship. To be fair, I have seen nothing to suggest this being a widely believed conspiracy, but there are many who still believe the encompassing myth regarding the denial of an escort. This book published in 2001, Ordeal by Sea, which includes a foreword and afterword by Captain Toady himself, states the following about her departure from Guam. The Indianapolis cleared Apra Harbor at 0910 hours on 28th July. Her voyage across to Leyte should have been simple and uneventful. Captain McVeigh was given a routine warning that three submarine contacts had been reported within 200 miles of the ship's plotted course. He asked for an escort, but was told that no destroyer or destroyer escort was available. It made little difference. The big cruiser had been traveling unescorted for most of her career, and one more such voyage would not matter. This book clearly states that a request was made by Captain McVeigh and then denied. Other books will say much the same. I selected to read from this book because Captain Toady's name is on the cover of the book, and now he is the one who has issued statements to the contrary. So I did want to ask him about this apparent contradiction, and I did receive a reply from the Indies Legacy Organization which stated the following. You are correct that Captain Toady was unable to edit or deal by sea prior to Penguin publishing it. The book was written by Thomas Helm, an Indie sailor who was not aboard when the ship was sunk, hence he was not a survivor. He had passed away prior to Penguin's reprinting of the book, so we were unable to contact him to determine his source of information. As happens so often in this and many other retellings of history, our suspicion is that Helm merely parroted prior myths, without confirming they were true. As you probably know, Helm originally published the book in 1963, when McVeigh was still alive. We suspect, but cannot confirm, that McVeigh would have corrected Helm if he had read the book, but no rewrites were ever released. As for Captain Toady, he stated the following. During Captain McVeigh's court of inquiry that preceded the court-martial, Captain McVeigh was asked if he had asked for an escort, and he categorically said he had not. So Captain McVeigh said himself that he had not asked for an escort. During the court of inquiry, he said it was not the prerogative of a commanding officer to request an escort. So now, we know that Captain McVeigh made no such request for a destroyer escort. However, this passage from the book Ordeal by Sea additionally points out that Captain McVeigh was provided intelligence that three submarine contacts were reported in the area he would be transiting. Captain Toady addresses this with the following. Later, during one of Captain McVeigh's oral histories, he admitted that he had transited through areas in the Pacific many times, through areas that were known to be inhabited by Japanese submarines, unescorted. And he'd done it many times and never occurred to him that he needed an escort from Guam to Leyte, particularly this late in the war. Captain Toady goes on to say that this late in the war, no one really expected that Japanese submarines would still pose a significant threat in that region of the South Pacific, as American forces were then closing in on mainland Japan. Therefore, in combination with his own experience, Captain McVeigh simply did not believe he needed an escort. As Captain Toady points out, history would of course prove otherwise. In the end, it would seem his fateful encounter with Commander Hashimoto was merely a very unfortunate crossing of paths, combined with Commander Hashimoto's deadly accuracy and use of an inescapable formation of torpedoes. Myth number two. The Indies SOS message was received by naval personnel, but ignored. Even more significant than being denied an escort, the second myth is that as the ship was sinking, the Indies radio operator sent out an SOS message that was confirmed as being both transmitted and then received by no less than three radio operators on shore in the Philippines. As the story goes, these messages were then reported to various naval commanders, 
but blatantly ignored by these men, with two rescue boats even being called back by one of these commanders, furious that the tugs had been launched without his approval. Radios are down, but I jerry rigged the wires, sir. You sent the SOS out? Yes, sir. Look at the needles. They're moving. Good work. Carry on. Indianapolis? Indianapolis, do you copy? This is Leyte. What's going on? Three calls, sir. One caller identified himself as the captain. I dispatched three tugboats. On well, whose command? Them. Pull them back. We don't send anyone out until we get confirmation of their position. That could be an enemy sub trying to draw us out. Yes, sir. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Even the original myth is not presented accurately in this film, because the officer in question was said to have arrived several hours after the tugs were launched. Certainly, if you read the books, what makes this dramatic addition to the story more tragic is that the rescue tugs were said to have been gone for seven hours, covering more than a third of the distance to reach the site of the sinking before being called back. If it isn't obvious, here is why this myth is important to address. This assertion that the message was received and ignored, and that rescue boats were called back, would imply that those commanders' actions inadvertently resulted in the deaths of hundreds of men. As a side note, we do know for certain that the ship's radio operators did attempt to transmit an SOS as the Indianapolis was sinking. So the movie Jaws certainly got the SOS message part of the story completely wrong, with the captain saying that the ship didn't even attempt to transmit a message. It was coming back from the island of Tinian, the lady just delivered the bum, the Hiroshima bum. What we didn't know was our bomb mission had been so secret, no distress signal had been sent. <laughs> now, while I don't expect anyone has watched the movie Jaws to study for a history exam, it is now obvious that their top-secret mission to transport the atomic bomb had been completed when they reached Tinian, where the bomb was then offloaded. The ship then briefly ported in Guam for resupply before being ordered to Leyte, which was now just a routine transit, not a top-secret mission. But Jaws was the only place I heard this take on the SOS message, while most other sources say that the message was transmitted and then received, but ignored. Captain Toady now tells us that this myth has been debunked, or at least no evidence has been found to verify the accounts of those men who have claimed to have received the SOS message. And in fact, there is no evidence that the SOS was received in any Navy port or by any naval radio station. I was quite surprised to learn this. On one hand, I would expect that a film might embellish true events or take creative liberties to fill in pieces of unknown information or otherwise toss in pieces of blatant fiction to make the film more dramatic. But clearly, the films are not the only place where this information is presented as true. For example, in the book In Harm's Way, when referring to the ship's radio man Jack Miner, after he had abandoned the ship, it reads as follows. And then he began swimming hard. He was confident that a distress message had left the ship, and he told himself that rescue had to be on its way. In fact, in a radio shack on the island of Leyte, 650 miles to the west, the message had gotten through. It was received by a sailor named Claire B. Young on security duty near the sleeping quarters of one Commodore Jacob Jacobson, the ranking officer of the Leyte Naval Operating Base at Taklaban. Sometime after midnight, a messenger arrived at the post with a dispatch. Young read the message by flashlight and quickly realized that it needed to be brought to the Commodore's immediate attention. The message announced that the USS Indianapolis had been torpedoed and gave her coordinate positions. Young hurried inside Jacobson's hut, which was perched on a hill overlooking Leyte Harbor. Jacobson was asleep under an umbrella of mosquito netting. Young turned his flashlight on the Commodore's face and announced, I have a radio message for you, sir. Jacobson roused himself and, rising on one elbow, read the message by the flashlight's beam. Do you have a reply, sir? Young finally asked. No reply at this time, the man said. If any further messages are received, notify me at once. He sent Young away. Confused, the sailor returned to his post. No effort was made to either confirm or to deny the SOS's legitimacy. And there is a footnote here that says several days later, Young would notice that the Indy had been assigned a berth in the Leyte Harbor. He would notice as well that she hadn't yet shown up in that berth. 
Remembering the radio message, he was puzzled, but said nothing, because, as he later explained, he knew that other people were aware of the SOS, too. In other words, as a lowly enlisted sailor, he felt his hands were tied, and that his opinion would matter little. And this is something I repeated in the Part 1 episode. So now the book goes on to say that the message was received at least two, if not three more times. A second message was also received at Leyte, according to a sailor named Donald Allen. Allen was serving as a jeep driver for the acting commander of the Philippine Sea Frontier, Commodore Norman Gillette. From his office in Tolosa, 12 miles south of Tacloban, Gillette oversaw all naval operations on the island. Shortly after midnight on July 30th, a radio man in the officer of the day's Quonset hut, where Allen was standing guard duty, announced that he had just received a distress message from the Indy that listed her coordinates. In response, an officer on duty then dispatched two fast ocean-going Navy tugs from the Leyte Harbor, bound for the site of the sinking. At the time, Commodore Gillette himself was playing bridge on the nearby island of Samar, north of Leyte, with a group of officers. According to Allen, later that night, upon hearing that the tugs had been dispatched without his authority, Gillette recalled them to the harbor, even though they had completed about seven hours of the 21-hour cruise. No further investigations were made to determine if indeed a ship was sinking. Finally, a third message was received aboard a landing craft in the Leyte Harbor. A sailor named Russell Hetz was on watch when the ship's radio room received an SOS dispatch from a ship claiming to be the USS Indianapolis. And then, eight and a half minutes later, Hetz's ship received a duplicate message. The radio crew tried contacting the Indy but couldn't get a response. Hetz's vessel forwarded the message through channels, presumably to the Leyte Naval Operating Base, but it was ignored. The prevailing protocol within Naval Command was that messages that couldn't be confirmed by a reply were to be disregarded as pranks. Such responses were more or less pro forma at this point in the war. The Japanese forces, hoping to confuse U.S. intelligence and draw out search vessels, had made a habit of broadcasting bogus distress signals. Earlier in the war, such a message might have been investigated, but tonight, it was written off as a potentially deadly move in the war game. As with other contentious pieces of the story, these men's accounts are not mentioned in all of the books and articles written about this story. In fact, this may be one of the few places that all these men's accounts are included. But considering the specificity of these details given here, names, ranks, times, locations, after watching Captain Toady's videos, it seemed baffling to me that an author would just manufacture such specific details out of whole cloth. So I had to ask, did these men even exist? Where did this information come from? Well, there is a footnote on that same page which reads as follows. Claire Young's account didn't come to light until 1955. That year, after reading a Los Angeles Times story and a subsequent Saturday Evening Post article about the sinking, Young was surprised to learn that no record existed of anyone receiving the Indies SOS. Young wrote to the Navy Department, which replied that the Post story, in particular, was an account of an individual survivor and not sponsored in all its facts and conclusions by the U.S. Navy. Russell Hetz and Donald Allen made their recollections public in 1998, as the survivors were working in Congress to exonerate Captain McVeigh. Considering this footnote, I did also ask Captain Toady for clarification about these three men's accounts, and I did receive an initial reply from a representative of the Legacy Organization. The response essentially states that while it is not journalistic malpractice to report what somebody said, it should not have been presented as true in this book without independent verification by the author. In other words, what the author did not say was that following these three individuals' claims, the Navy went back to the radio logs in question and found no evidence of their claims. So then why would three men misremember something like that? Are they telling the truth, indicating that there was a cover-up of some kind? Keep in mind, these men were reportedly in three separate locations when they claimed to have received the SOS message. My first thought was, what if the logbooks were altered to cover up the negligence of those two Commodores? The response I received goes on to say that the Navy further found that the logbooks could not credibly have been forged or altered to conceal the fact that the reports had been received. I do have more to add on this idea of a cover-up later, but first, I have to say that it was difficult to find very much information on these three men, outside of what was printed in this book, specifically Donald Allen and Russell Hetz. 
Again, most accounts of the story do not even mention their names. But I did manage to find some additional information about Claire Young's personal account, published in a HistoryNet.com article. This article repeats the same information as the previous footnote, and then goes on to explain what Claire Young did over the following decades. Claire stated that in 1955, he read the news articles which indicated no SOS message had been received. He then wrote a letter to an Admiral Arleigh Burke, Chief of Naval Operations, stating that he had received a distress message from the USS Indianapolis. To reiterate, Claire never said he was the radio operator on duty, but rather a sailor standing watch on security duty. He says the SOS message was hand-delivered to him at approximately 12.30 a.m. that morning, written down on a piece of paper but I have found nothing to suggest he provided anyone with the name of either the courier who gave him the message or the radio operator who had written it down. Whatever the case, Young stated in his letter, I personally delivered this message to the senior officer present, Commodore Jacob H. Jacobson, United States Navy. The message, although garbled, identified the ship, its position, and its condition. Commodore Jacobson's answer, in effect, was no reply at this time. If any further messages are received, notify me immediately. I feel that it is my duty to let it be known that the lost distress signal was received. The Navy's Civil Relations Division apparently replied to this letter with a polite dismissal, making it clear that the Navy had no intention of adding Claire's story to the record without evidence. Not to be deterred by this, Claire Young would evidently make repeated efforts to make his account known to the world. He contacted wartime naval correspondent Richard F. Newcomb three years later, in 1958, the author of Abandoned Ship, Death of the USS Indianapolis. He contacted Dan Kurzman, the author of Fatal Voyage, in early 1990. Kurzman believed him and would then make an amendment to his book's paperback copies before they were printed. After 45 years, this was apparently the first publication that contained Claire Young's personal account. That very same month, the article goes on to say, Captain McVeigh's own son, Kimo, having been notified about Claire's story, would contact him in an effort to find out more about what he knew about the night of the sinking. In response, Young wrote a letter back to Kimo detailing what he remembered, including that he had a suspicion that Commodore Jacobson had been drinking that night a strong odor of alcohol coming from his room, and that Jacobson's decision not to respond to the SOS was a missed opportunity to save hundreds of lives. The next person that Young appears to have spoken with after chemo was 12-year-old Hunter Scott, who was gathering information for his school history project. Young provided him with copies of the letters he had sent and received over the past decades, as well as a full account of his story. The article also says that Young contacted Captain Toady during the mid-90s, and that Captain Toady offered to help him verify his story, but then Claire Young unfortunately passed away at the age of 75 before any progress was made. Since I did have Captain Toady's email, at this point I reached out to him directly to ask whether the article got this part of the story right, and here is his reply. The article gets that mostly right, but the sequence of events is wrong. I believe the other bits dealing with Claire Young are also wrong. I don't recall who reached out to whom, but somehow a conversation occurred between Young Hunter Scott and Claire Young, 1996 or prior. Hunter then began repeating Young's report without independent verification, as if Young's report had been established fact. And yes, Claire Young reached out to me directly around that time too, prompted by encouragement from the survivors. And yes, in early 1997, I offered to help him get the word out if his report could be verified, which it never was. But then my submarine was deployed in April of 1997, at which point I had my hands full with operational matters and pretty much disengaged. Unfortunately, when Young passed away in August of 1997, I was still on deployment, so Young and I did not ever have a follow-up conversation. I picked the issue back up after returning from deployment in October of 1997. I was interested to learn if there was an element of the story I had not yet heard, so I asked Hunter for the basis of his statements. I can't recall the specific sequence, whether Hunter and I had this conversation before or after he came to Hawaii in February of 1998 to take a cruise on my submarine. I think we had the conversation when he was aboard the ship. It became obvious to me that Hunter had not verified the story, he was merely repeating it. So I reached out to Dr. William Dudley's office at the Naval History Command, now called Naval History and Heritage Command, to inquire about whether they had ever investigated Young's claims. 
As you know, the claims were originally made in the 1950s, and it was not clear whether those claims had been investigated in the 1950s when so many of the key players were still alive. Admiral Nimitz, Commodore Jacobson, etc. In the 1990s, NHC said they had pulled Young's service record, but it did not appear he would have been stationed in a place where the information he claimed to have received could have been received. NHC further investigated by pulling radio logs of the radio station Young claimed had received the SOS. I was told those logs were complete and unaltered, with original signatures of the men who had been standing watch at the time. So if there had been a cover-up, it had to have been a massive one, where entire radio log books with hundreds upon hundreds of entries were falsified and completely rewritten to surreptitiously delete entries that would have recorded receipt of the SOS contemporaneously. This would mean the complete reconstructing of quite a number of radio watch standers and supervisors entries and their signatures, meaning dozens of people would have therefore had to have been involved in the cover-up. All of this to cover up a scandal that, at the time, nobody would have known was coming. The naval historians concluded that this was simply beyond believability, so we can only presume that Young must have simply misremembered his account. And back in the 90s, when we took this before Congress, young Hunter Scott did end up sticking with Claire Young's account despite all of this. Regardless, the congressional resolution passed and justice was finally served. It would not have happened without Hunter since he brought national attention to the matter, even if he did stumble a bit while doing so. And in the end, because of the lack of evidence, I'm afraid Young's claims brought more heat to the matter than light. I hope this helps. Signed, Captain William J. Toady, United States Navy, retired. So, there you have it. With all of that taken into consideration, I did go back and make the necessary changes to the episode before uploading it. In addition to these three or four unverified SOS message reports, there is also this additional aspect of the story involving American intelligence intercepting a radio transmission from Commander Hashimoto. That's exactly what I want. Our hero ship that delivered the bomb in record time got sunk four days ago. What? How many survived? 317. 879 men lost their lives. Command screwed the pooch on three SOS calls from Indianapolis. That's not including an intercepted message from the Japanese I-58 that did the sinking. Son of a bitch. As portrayed in this film, Men of Courage, the book Fatal Voyage likewise indicates that U.S. signals intelligence operators intercepted and decoded a transmission from the Japanese sub I-58, which was a report that they had successfully sunk an enemy ship. It reads as follows. A ship had been sunk, then where was the SOS? Captain Layton's men at the Sink Pack Combat Intelligence Office in Guam were baffled. It was early Monday morning, July 30th, and they were pondering an intercepted enemy message that had just been decoded. The commander of the Japanese submarine I-58 boasted that he had sunk a ship. But what type of ship? What was the latitude and longitude where it went down? The Americans had broken the Japanese code, but unfortunately, not the grids reflecting these particular facts. I-58 didn't seem very important to the Guam experts, even though their files indicated that the submarine was lurking in the general area where the Indianapolis was sailing. Now, with the confusion around the SOS message, I did opt to leave this part of the story out of the episodes I did, but I can confirm this is accurate, with the Navy's Sink Pack Top Secret Dispatch records now declassified and available to read online, supporting what is written here. This does, of course, beg the question. If the Indianapolis had failed to arrive in Leyte, and U.S. intelligence knew there were Japanese submarines operating in that area, and then they intercepted Hashimoto's radio transmission about sinking a ship, why did no one realize the Indianapolis had been sunk, or at least consider it? The book continues to point out that, with no SOS message being received from the Indy, this wasn't considered a confirmation that she had been sunk. And without knowing what type of ship Commander Hashimoto was speaking of, nor where it was sunk, because they couldn't decode the coordinates, why give special attention to this message when they were so overloaded with enemy reports already? That, and since we know that the Indianapolis was repeatedly marked as overdue, and then presumed to have been rerouted when she failed to arrive in Leyte, her continued absence was more or less disregarded. 
Whether this presumption about the ship being rerouted was done as a matter of standard protocol or not, this is at least one administrative failure that we can consider on the part of the U.S. Navy, a portion of negligence that resulted in unnecessary losses of survivors. Had no one considered trying to contact the Indianapolis to verify she was safe? Had they tried to contact her and received no reply? It seems that if they had put two and two together, a missing ship combined with a Japanese radio message about sinking a ship, they might have then at least launched a minimal search effort to look for evidence of a sunken ship. I don't know how strapped for resources they were, but perhaps even a single aircraft sent to fly low over the water following the Indianapolis's route between Guam and Leyte? They did know the exact time they had intercepted Hashimoto's radio message. They also knew when the Indianapolis had left Guam and when the ship was supposed to arrive in Leyte. Unless I'm missing something, couldn't they have then used those times, along with the ship's cruising speed, to calculate a rough estimate of how far the Indianapolis would have traveled before being sunk, which would then give them an approximate location to search? Even without an SOS message, it still seems like there were a lot of red flags that were either ignored or overlooked. And perhaps those failures and their tragic consequences are what drove the Navy to prosecute Captain McVeigh so as to pin everything on one man. Although four days later, it was just lucky Lieutenant Gwynn's plane happened to be flying that route and found the survivors. Taking all of this into consideration, I suppose the truth of any story is a difficult thing to procure, even with multiple eyewitnesses. This myth was difficult for me to contend with. All of the specific details, names, dates, ranks, locations, would seem to lend credibility to this information being true. And yet, knowing what we do now, this is certainly one more myth worth debunking, especially because, like Captain McVeigh, those naval commanders whose names are listed, such as Commodore Jacobson and Gillette, they have, for decades now, been wrongfully accused of inadvertently causing the deaths of hundreds of men by their reported negligence. I mean, what did you think of the officer in the film when he says this? The captain, I dispatched three tugboats. On whose command? Pull them back! We don't send anyone out until we get confirmation of their position. That could be an enemy sub trying to draw us out. Yes. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Hollywood didn't portray his character as being very likable, did they? Sure, I think we've all served under a few officers we didn't see eye to eye with, but is that worth dragging the names of Commodores Jacobson and Gillette through the mud without evidence? Hopefully, with this and other stories, the truth will always find a way to make itself known. Since it was mentioned in the first episode, I should also briefly address this final myth. Myth number three, the Indy sailors watched the flag go up on Iwo Jima. Although this myth doesn't seem to affect the overall story nearly as much as the other two, this is apparently not accurate. According to Captain Toady, the ship's deck logs indicate that the ship was 200 miles away from the island of Iwo Jima, undergoing a resupply at sea, when the flag was being raised. The Indianapolis was still a key element of the battle for Iwo Jima, providing artillery bombardment, but she was not in fact an eyewitness to the legendary flag racing on Mount Suribachi. Admittedly, I enjoyed believing this was true, because I am a Marine, and this event became an iconic symbol for both World War II and specifically the United States Marine Corps' legacy. They have statues of this event all over the place. But with regard to the Indianapolis witnessing it, this appears to be another unfortunate embellishment to the story. Now that those three myths have been spoken for, here again is a list of the remaining myths that need to be corrected in the history books. If it isn't obvious from reading this list, several of these myths involve the more heart-wrenching or tragic details of the story, some of which I had included in my own script before removing them. Things like Captain McVeigh keeping the hate mail he received from the lost men's families and painfully rereading these letters over the following years, or the notion that when he killed himself, he was found clutching a small figurine in his left hand a toy sailor that had been given to him as a child by his father. But rather than stealing his thunder any further, if you wish to know the explanations for these other 13 myths, and possibly more information he might share in future, I will allow Captain Toady to explain that himself. The videos posted by him are located on the USS Indianapolis Legacy Organizations page, which I will link in the description of this video. On that note, if you have the time to do so, 
Considering the amount of time and passion that he has clearly put into preserving the Indianapolis' incredible legacy and taking care of the survivors and their families, I'm sure it would mean a great deal to Captain Toady if you could show the Indies channel some love, drop a comment on his videos, and let him know that the message he has been trying to send out to the world has been received. Now I'd like to offer a more personal message to you, my viewer. I come to YouTube primarily for entertainment myself, so I do appreciate you watching this video even though you might have come here to the channel looking for a story. I have to admit, since I was nearly done with the part 2 episode before I learned about these inaccuracies and I was already undergoing a lot of personal stress, I was sick for two weeks, and then we suddenly had a death in the family, um, all of which took place as I was making this episode. Um, it was very hard not to just post the video and not say anything. I've always wanted to maintain a professional relationship with the channel, and I just wasn't sure how to effectively communicate my many personal life issues without it all seeming like a bunch of excuses. I created the channel to share stories with you guys, not my problems. Right, uh, And thinking I would have time for it, I also put my foot in my mouth by announcing my plans in a community page post to even have a new episode out by Halloween. But then I found the videos posted by Captain Toady and realized the Indianapolis episodes were filled with myths. I think I took an entire day just to decide what I was going to do about that. It was, it was a tough decision for me. I know you guys are always very kind, understanding, and patient. And as you can tell... My conscience just wouldn't let me post the episode without making the corrections. It ultimately took me an additional three weeks to conduct the research I've presented here, you know, the back and forth emails and, and the contacts that I made and, and, and digging into the material, as well as the work required to go back and fix the Indianapolis episode, which meant I had once again broken my word with my viewers about the Halloween episode, I mean. And even now, this video has taken time away from completing that episode. Uh, but when it is finished, I think you'll enjoy it. Very creepy stuff. But all of that said, because I sincerely appreciate the thought of you looking forward to each video, I will commit to communicating any changes or unexpected delays when they happen in the future. Uh, probably just a community page post. And because it is understandable that I have lost a few patrons and channel members because of these delays in getting a new episode out, as well as my poor communication about those delays, I do want to offer a sincere thank you to my patrons, my YouTube channel members, and all of my subscribers for your continued support. I certainly hope I can make it up to you in future. In closing, as with many of the stories I've done, the story of the USS Indianapolis affected me greatly while working on it. It shocked me, angered me, it brought me to tears multiple times, and yet it still left me with an incredible feeling of hope. Really, after dwelling on it, this is probably a great privilege to be one of the first creators to offer a corrected account of the story after nearly 80 years of inaccurate retellings. I agree with Captain Toady when he stated, it does no service to the courage and sacrifice of the crews who have sailed under the name of the USS Indianapolis to exploit the mythology and to amplify the fiction. I hope Wartime Stories can do the same for more of these incredible stories in future. Once again, I do sincerely thank you for watching, and may God be with you.